This is Brian Carlton for ABN Newswire. Professor Ian Plymer is from the University of Adelaide, the School of Earth and Environmental Sciences. He's Australia's best known geologist. He's the Emeritus Professor of Earth Sciences at the University of Melbourne. He also has done way too many things to mention in this intro, but he has just published his seventh book, which is called Heaven and Earth, Global Warming, the Missing Science. Professor Ian Plymer, welcome to ABN. Thank you very much. You're a bit of a poster boy for the, uh, clo uh, for the climate change sceptic movement. Well, I'm not sceptical about climate change at all. Climates always change. They always have, and they always will. And that's in many ways the purpose of the book, that if you ignore history, you come up with a conclusion which does, doesn't fit in with the evidence. And that is that we're suddenly in a period where climates change. We're not. Climates always change. They change much quicker and much greater than anything we measure today. So you completely refute the argument that human-induced human climate change is, uh, is occurring. It, although there is climate change, but humans aren't causing it. There are local climate changes that humans influence, and that's mainly from land clearing. So we see the retreat of the ice on Mount Kilimanjaro is from land clearing. A minor extinction of a frog in Central America is from land clearing. But in terms of global climates, no. Climates have always changed. They've never been driven by carbon dioxide in the past. They've been driven by much, much greater forces. You accept, though, that there's been some uh, warming, particularly in the period between 1976 and 1998, but again, not human-induced? Well, I accept that there's been warming since the little ice age finished in 1850. It warmed, and then it cooled, and then it warmed again, and from 1940 to 1976 it cooled, then it warmed to 1998, then it was static for a little while, and then it cooled again since 2003. So temperatures are always changing. It's quite normal. So the thousands of learned scientists who have been uh, propagating the human-induced climate change, uh, what would you call it, almost a religion now, from your point of view, they're all wrong? Science works on evidence. It doesn't work on consensus. That's what politics is about. And we have a really good example of that. Some years ago we all thought that we got stomach ulcers from an acid stomach. Everyone thought that. Everyone knew it. All the scientists said this was the case until these two West Australian scientists said, no, 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 it's due to bacteria, and no one listened. And eventually they had to ingest bacteria, gave themselves ulcers, and showed that the whole scientific community was wrong. Now, science has its fads, it has its fashions, it has its leaders, it has its dictators, it has its fraud, and what we're dealing with with human-induced climate change is one group of scientists, and they are the atmospheric scientists, have taken the atmosphere completely out of the earth, ocean, ice, life, sun and heavens, and just tortured that to death with their computer models, and eventually the atmosphere has confessed. So that group of scientists have dominated the airwaves, and the reason for that is that they're giving us a disastrous future. And people are getting frightened, oh my God, we're all going to die. And that's dominated thinking. Is it not true, though, that the uh, massive release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere over the past 100, 150 years is bound to have some effect in a closed system like the, uh, like the planet's ecosphere? The Earth is, is not a closed system. We have 40,000 tonnes a year of material from space dropping in onto Earth. The second thing is we have some really good ice core work from the South Pole where drilling in the ice has been able to work, we've been able to work out what the temperature was and what the carbon dioxide content was, and the temperature rose and then suddenly went down again, and it rose again and suddenly went down again, and carbon dioxide also rose, but 800 years later. Now here we are, 800 years after the medieval warming, when we had a 400 year period when it was incredibly warm, where it was so warm that on Greenland there was barley and wheat grown, there were sheep and cattle, and we're 800 years after that. So our global warming catastrophists have never explained why carbon dioxide is increasing. They say it's industrialisation, but it equally as well could be the medieval warming. That's never been explained. So do you think it would have any effect on the atmosphere at all, all that CO2? Carbon dioxide has an effect on the atmosphere, and it has an effect for the first 50 parts per million. And once it's done its job, then it's finished, and you can double it and quadruple it, and it has no effect, because we've seen that in the geological past. We've seen it in times gone by when the carbon dioxide content was a hundred times the current content. We didn't have runaway global warming. We actually had glaciation. So there's immediately a disconnect 
So carbon dioxide is absolutely vital for living on Earth. It's plant food. All of life lives off carbon dioxide. To demonise it shows that you don't understand skilled child science. So why are the, uh, the scientists who are putting this theory forward What's in it for them? Oh, I think you've just got to follow the money. Oh, there have been climate institutes set up where they're lavishly funded. They're popping up all over the place. They're going around frightening people witless. They're filled by people in all sorts of odd disciplines who um, really don't work in science uh, or work in atmospheric science. So I think it's a case to follow the money. It was 50 years ago we had the same sort of institutes looking at nuclear science. We've got the same sort of institutes popping up for other uh, great causes and fads. So I, I think it's you've just got to take a, a normal view you'd take if you were going out and buying a second hand car. So the process would be the scientists lobby the politicians, but what's in it for the politicians? Maintaining the status quo is always the easiest thing to do for any group of politicians. Why have they jumped on the bandwagon and upsetting business, upsetting households, generally upsetting people? Again, what's in it for the politicians? Well the politicians want to get re-elected and there's a significant green vote, especially coming out of cities and the politicians are followers, they're not leaders. And it is the green vote that's pushing politicians, often in public, to say things which, in private, they have a different view about. I spend quite a bit of my time in private with politicians. I also spend a lot of my time, as a geologist, looking at rocks in the bush, and when you look at a rock, you can actually see previous sea level changes and climate changes. And I'm yet to find people in rural Australia that would argue that humans change climate. So we've got a city-country divide, we've got fairly wealthy city people that are feeling guilty about being wealthy, they've got a cause and they push government very hard and government is resisting but it's following a little bit. There's two fairly clearly delineated camps in this argument. Is it not true that we're only going to know definitively, based on the science, when or if the climate changes or if it doesn't? Well. We humans have experienced massive climate change. We've lived in glaciations, we've lived in times when it's been much warmer. So if you move from, say, Melbourne to Hong Kong, there's a huge temperature increase. You don't die because of that, you adapt. Humans have done that over history, archaeological and geological time. We have adapted. So a temperature change is not going to kill us. What it will do is that if we put in policies without a massive due diligence, we will put ourselves out of work, we will put our children out of work, we will shift businesses in Australia which have a great advantage like mining, smelting and energy industries, we will shift them offshore. So if you want to be um, cautious about the future, don't put yourself and your children out of work because we humans can survive warm times. You've called for an open and transparent debate on this issue. Why has it not been open and transparent so far? A story that frightens people witless sells much better than saying, look, things are not as bad as they seem to be. There's never been a debate. It's only been dogma. We've had people talked down to by pompous, arrogant scientists. We've had various broadcasting networks try to make people feel guilty. We've had people who are intuitively saying, look, I don't think this is right. They haven't had the science, so they feel helpless and they feel disenfranchised. And as soon as this book came out three weeks ago, it became a bestseller because people have finally got something to say. Here is a complete view of the way the planet works. I now have a book that reinforces the view that intuitively I came to. Is the public generally well enough educated in science to make these sorts of distinctions without books such as yours? No, they're not, but the public's not stupid and they're getting treated as if they're stupid. Intuitively, people in rural areas know that there are cycles of climate. They don't know at what time they are, but there are cycles of climate driven by the sun and driven by wobbles in the Earth's orbit and driven by where we are in the galaxy and driven by tides and then in the occasional event like a big volcano. They know that, but they don't know the exact numbers on it. So the public is being treated as if they're stupid. I think in many ways they're rebelling and saying, no, we don't accept what we're being told. We're going to read another view. And yet your critics would argue that many of those other causes for climate change that you've just mentioned uh, have been uh, analysed and rejected. Well, this is why the subtitle of Heaven and Earth 
is global warming the missing science. There's a huge amount of science which is in the peer-reviewed refereed journals which has never been looked at by my critics. They only look at the atmosphere. So I've dealt with the whole lot and if they cherry pick and selectively take the atmosphere then they get a story that's unrelated to the way the world works. Most of my critics are playing the man. They've never ever discussed science with me and as soon as someone plays the man you know you've won the game. I'm speaking with uh, Professor Ian Plymer who's uh brand new book is terrific read it's called heaven and earth global warming the missing science there's a little picture of it for you now um you've actually been criticized for using the endorsements of politicians for books given that you criticize say the ipcc for uh being a politicized body um how, how do you react to that sort of criticism well i've had uh, endorsing on the back of heaven and earth i've had rushlaf klaus the president of the eu he has written a book on this subject he's certainly a politician uh, nigel lawson a former politician uh, and he's written uh, an endorsement on the back. He's also written a book on climate change. I go into history a lot, and I've had Australia's foremost historian, uh, the economic historian, Professor Geoffrey Blaney. So I have certainly used people who have published work on this subject. I've done that very deliberately because there's not only a divide between city and country, a divide between people who have a big view of the world and a very narrow view of the world. There's also a political divide, and conservatives in the left and conservatives in the right share this view. So this has almost been picked up as a, uh, a new form of fundamentalist religion. In fact, you've pretty much described it as that in the book. I is it that rabid? Yes, in chapter 8 I go into a comparison between the hallmarks of fundamentalist religions and uh, deep green politics. And I once wrote a book on fundamentalist uh, religions. I'm moderately familiar with the way they operate. And uh, in this book I argue that the failure of European socialism, the failure of European Christian um, causes and the fact that a lot of people now are wealthy, they need something to believe in, they need something to hang, to hang on to. So this is filling and a void in our lives in many ways? This is a spiritual void okay. and this is why there are many people who have no science, have grasped onto the fact that we must do something. They don't know what it is and they don't want it to hurt but we must do something. So I argue uh, from a spiritual basis in the last chapter and I've had a number of my theologian friends look at it and give me the tick of approval. So uh, some have even called for your trial and incarceration for, uh, for purporting these sort of views. It, you know that there's something going on when it gets to that stage, oh, surely. Oh yes, look, once they, once they call for my trial and incarceration, you know that they're not going to argue science and that they're rattled. And if I'm incarcerated, well, I'd happily have a life sentence with a lovely blonde. <laughs> Oh, where do you go from there? Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, you get a second last <laughs> 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 Okay. Okay. Um, what would you say to the argument that even if there is some slight chance of the worst case scenarios being thrown out there happening, is it worth trying to do something now to stop it? Is, and what sorts of things could we do? Or is your fundamental position, hey, this is a complete waste of time? Firstly, carbon dioxide is plant food. It's fabulous stuff. We pump hot carbon dioxide into glass houses to make horticultural businesses thrive. The second thing is we humans have lived in warm times, we've lived in cold times, we can adapt. The third thing is, from looking back in history, the great boom times economically were the current times, the medieval warming and the Roman warming. And we know that every time it's warm, we have booming economies. I hope I'm wrong. That means we'll have a warm, carbon dioxide-rich planet and economies will thrive. In saying that, though, are you not taking into account the fact that, say, sea level rise is likely to wipe out coastal communities around the place and uh, there's an, a, a deleterious economic impact there? Sea level rises and falls quite considerably. The biggest sea level rises and falls we have in the past are 1,500 metres. In this last glaciation, which has been going for 37 million years, we've had sea level go up and down by about 130 metres. 6,000 years ago, it was two metres higher than now. Now, not only do we have sea level go up and down, we have the land level go up and down. So here we have England. They've got a Scottish Prime Minister. There's a Scottish Parliament, independent from Westminster. And Scotland's rising, and as a result, Eastern England is sinking. So they've got the trifecta there. They've lost everything. <laughs> and this we know. We can measure land level going up and down and sea level going up and down and what happens is we get migration. It's always happened. The next great sea level change will be a fall because we've 
probably got the maximum rise because in previous times when we've had sea level rise we haven't melted the ice sheet because we've still got ancient ice there which we can measure. So we've not had those changes in the past and there's no reason why we should look at them in the future. One of the uh, scary predictions being made by some of the cli climate change scientists and they seem to be having an impact on politicians as well is that we're going to get hordes if not millions of uh, flooded refugees heading south to inhabit the north of Australia. You don't buy that argument obviously? <laughs> well I'm, I'm old enough to, to have seen those arguments dressed up in different ways in politics. This is scare tactics. Uh, uh, it's hype, it's ideology, unrelated to evidence. What I've got is a book of evidence. It's the missing science. It covers a great spectrum of science. We look at sea level in great detail in this book. I think it's the least we have to worry about. Should we do anything at all about CO2 emissions? CO2 emissions are in many ways tied into pollution. And in the Western countries, we certainly have been addressing pollution because pollution kills. And we don't want to be putting muck into our waterways and our airways and into our soils. So we've been addressing pollution. At the same time, we've been stopping the sulphur-rich gases coming into the atmosphere, but we've still been pumping carbon dioxide out into the atmosphere. So we can separate carbon dioxide and pollution. We are well down that track. In many growing economies, they still have to do that and that will happen. We know from England only 60 years ago the massive pea soup of fogs killed people. They now still pump out carbon dioxide but they don't have those filthy fogs. So we can do it as long as we're wealthy. Professor Ian Plymer, let me run some things by you. It was sort of a pop quiz here um, and I want you to tell me whether in your opinion they're rubbish or not. Quickly, inexorable global temperature rise caused by humans. Zero out of ten. Zero out of ten, okay. Stronger, more catastrophic cyclones and hurricanes? I think we'll have to keep you in after school so you can learn a bit more. Fantastic. More extreme weather events? I think you have to go back to the drawing board. Accelerated polar melting? I think you need to put ice blocks in your drinks. And glaciers receding? Uh, you need to understand the glaciers recede and advance. With that one, I'll give you five out of ten. Okay. What about the shutting down of the North Atlantic Ocean current? It's never shut down. The only way we'll shut it down is if we stop the Earth spinning. And if you can stop the Earth spinning, best of luck. Ocean acidification. The oceans have never been acid. They will only be acid when we run out of rocks. Species loss? We're always getting species loss. We're always getting species turnover. It's a normal phenomenon. Nothing to be worried about. Incidentally, I noticed that was happening pretty significantly before there was any real global push for uh, anthropogenic climate change. Well, quite, but uh, different badge, same bandwagon. <laughs> Tropical disease migration into temperate areas. Well, that's mainly a reference to malaria. Uh, malaria actually thrives in cold climate areas as well as tropical areas. Uh, so I noticed that's one thing your critics get stuck into you about. Why do, you do, why do they, they say you're fundamentally wrong when you say that? About malaria? Yeah. Well, I only use Paul Reiter, who is, is the world authority on malaria, and who quotes uh, Shakespeare and the ague and the, and the uh, incidence of malaria in Siberia and uh, Scandinavia. Malaria has been quite widespread in cold climates. You get rid of malaria when you have an annual average income of more than 3,100 US dollars. Malaria is a disease of poverty. And finally, Al Gore. Oh, I think you should go back to uh, Hollywood. That was a very short answer. Would you like to expand a little <laughs> well, bit on that? I mean, The uh, Inconvenient Truth is one of the, the best-selling DVDs and what, what grossed lots of money for him. I mean, uh, is he completely wrong? What comes out of Hollywood? Hollywood fantasy comes out of it, so we give him a tick for that. Hollywood uh, fantasy to frighten you witless, we give him a tick for that. You get a good Hollywood blockbuster, you make a lot of money, he gets a tick for that. But... I hope you're not arguing that something that comes out of Hollywood is related to reality. Oh, no, I wouldn't know An that. inconvenient truth is a wonderful piece of entertainment, and then you go home and think, well, that was fantasy at its best. I've spoken to people who were genuinely frightened having watched that DVD. I can remember as a kid I was genuinely frightened by Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. Wasn't true. Scary movie, for sure. Now tell me whether any of these are a waste of time or not. I think I know what you're going to answer. CO2 emissions reductions policies. Send us break. Carbon trading schemes and or taxes. I want to know more about it. It's a wonderful opportunity to make a scam and to skin people alive. So you believe the, uh, the market boys have jumped on this one thinking oh, well, they can make billions? So. Oh, yeah. very much so. And unregulated billions. That's the good part about it. What about uh, large-scale solar and wind energy generation? Wonderful memorials to our stupidity. 
So really, well, that, that's all I'll be. The amount of energy you need to put in a wind farm is far more than it will ever produce in its working life. Secondly, its efficiency is such that you never know when you're going to need the power. The third thing is they surge and blow up the power systems. And the fourth thing is they produce a pathetically small amount of electricity. What about large-scale geothermal? Large-scale geothermal is a possibility. That is, of course, is natural nuclear power. Uh, it's developmental, it's experimental, and I'm a great supporter of following that further down the line because you could actually put some very large steam generating plants on geothermal systems. I have to mention it, nuclear power. Nuclear power, I don't know why we don't have nuclear power in this country. We need huge amounts of cheap baseload power to create water and to put electricity into the grid to attract industry, to employ people, that gives us a taxation base. It's an interesting argument, isn't it? On the one hand, the, uh, we must reduce, this is from the politicians, we must reduce CO2 emissions, therefore we must reduce our reliance on coal. The argument from the industry, the coal industry, the minerals industry says, hang on, that's crazy. And yet we have this other substance in abundance, uranium, and we're not using it in any real way at all, are we? And yet there's other countries screaming for it. Australia has 40% of the world's uranium. We're exporting yellow cake. Uh, we have the grid systems already there. The technology is there. You can almost go down to your local hardware store and buy a 200 megawatt generator now. It is so simple. Yet we are exporting all of this energy. My argument is that we put nuclear into the grid as well as coal because we have two forms of reliable, cheap baseload energy. And if I were king of the world, I would argue that not only do we mine uranium, create the yellow cake, we then create the fuel rods which we lease, we reprocess, we keep the reprocessed material for later fuel. We could actually control proliferation worldwide plus we could control nuclear energy. It is a generational opportunity. You get these once in a generation, Australia is not taking it. How do we overcome the fear factor? We fear things we can't see, like carbon dioxide in the air, like um, uh, alpha particles and beta particles and gamma particles. But as we sit here, we're getting two gamma particles go through our head every second. We're getting irradiated all the time. The fear factor is, is more that of ignorance. But if we look at nuclear power, we've really had only one serious accident. Three Mile Island was a success. All the systems worked. The shonky Russian system that fell apart was actually a human disaster. It is the safest form of power we can have. There's a big push on for biofuels at the moment. Now, the obvious downside there is you're using land that you could otherwise use for growing food to grow fuel. You're not a fan, are you? Not a great fan for that reason. The second reason is that there are other biofuels that could be made from floating organisms that undergo photosynthesis. That is a possibility, but again, it takes up huge areas of land. A couple of the uh, ones that are tying policymakers in knots at the moment, and scientists to an extent, as well as industry, clean coal technologies. Doable? I think clean coal technology, rather like geothermal, hot dry rock geothermal power, should be explored. It is very distinctly possible. Um, by burning something and creating steam, or having a radioactive decay and producing steam, is a very inefficient process. One of the great things that's come out of the current green movement to frighten us witless about global warming is that we are looking at having more efficient energy, and I think that's wonderful. What about uh, the sequestration of carbon? The numbers don't add up. You can certainly sequest uh, carbon dioxide into deep holes. That's where a lot of carbon dioxide comes from. We've got one old oil hole in Australia, the Caroline Number no. 5 well, and we pull carbon dioxide out of that hole, and Carlton and United Breweries use it to add to their beer. So we know that we can store carbon dioxide underground, but the sheer volume that we need to store, it just doesn't add up. How uh, long do you think it will be for the planet to collectively recognise that uh, we have been sold a pup here? I don't think it'll take too long. I think the economic crisis is certainly uh, focusing people's attention on costs. And I think if we have what many of the solar physicists are suggesting, sunspot cycle number 24, we could be in for quite a cold period. If they are correct, uh, that will focus people very quickly. 
It's curious, isn't it? The uh, climate change argument really picked up big here when we had our, uh, I think it was the last hot summer in uh, of the drought, the most recent drought in southeastern Australia. Uh, I notice in the uh, in some other parts of the world at the moment where they're having cold snaps, they are in fact going, oh, hang on a sec, it's gotten a bit cold, maybe this isn't really happening. Is it that simple in most people's minds? What's happening around them now is what's happening more broadly? No, we're looking at the weather and one swallow doesn't make a summer. However, previous droughts, say in the Darling River system, have been massive and those droughts have dried up the Darling River. We are still pumping water out of the Darling River. It is still flowing, yet we're in a drought. So it isn't a big drought compared with previous droughts. How do you uh, plan to use your um, position here as the so-called nominal poster boy for uh, <laughs> for climate change scepticism. What, what, apart from writing the book, which is terrific, but what, what, are you actively lobbying governments? Are you talking directly to politicians, policymakers, to to industry who are, in many respects, starting to dovetail in behind the politicians? Well, yes, I am talking to politicians of all colours. I am talking uh, to industry groups. Uh, I am in the business of professing my discipline. And my knowledge is world and planetary history. And I'm putting all that together. And when you take a step back and look at this, then you'll say, well, wait a minute, we've had all these phenomena before. What's so special about today? And we haven't had the warmers yet. Tell us any reason why today is any different from a thousand years ago. When will we have the proof, one way or the other? I think the proof will come fairly quickly, and that will be uh, coming from the sun, when the sun's Sunspot cycle number 24 really starts to bite. They would be looking at proof within 20 years. Professor Ian Plymer, it's a great read. It is called Heaven and Earth, Global Warming, The Missing Science, and I urge anybody who's interested in the subject to uh, have a read. Appreciate your time, sir. Thank, Thank you. you.